Welcome to Christ Church's Leadership Podcast. Uh, this is uh, kind of a second part in our Advent meditation. Uh, it's both and. It's uh, meant to be an Advent meditation to encourage you as we progress towards the birth, uh, celebrating the birth of the Christ child, as well as adding antecedents and uh, uh, teaching tidbits, if you will, about leadership, especially about leading from the from the second chair. I think foundationally, if you're going to have a podcast on spiritual leadership, you need to be rooted uh, in some text. And so today, our text is uh, John's letter. Uh, now, the Gospel of John, of course, is just that. It's the Gospel of John. And then this is an epistle from John. It's uh, 1 John chapter 5. For the sake of time, we're going to read verses... 1 through 5, and then we're going down and start with verse 12 through the rest of the chapter. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has become a child of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his children too. We know we love God's children if we love God and obey his commandments. Loving God means keeping his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For every child of God defeats this evil world, and we achieve this victory through our faith. And who can win this battle against the world? Only those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Let's go to verse 12. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have God's Son does not have life. I've written this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. We are confident that he hears us whenever we ask for anything that pleases him. And since we know that he hears us when we make our request, we also know that he will give us what we ask for. If we see a fellow believer sinning in a way that does not lead to death, you should pray and God will give that person life. But there is a sin that leads to death. And I am not saying you should pray for those who commit it. All wicked actions are sin, but not every sin leads to death. We know that God's children do not make a practice of sinning, for God's Son holds them securely, and the evil one cannot touch them. We know that we are children of God and that the world around us is under the control of the evil one. We know that the Son of God has come, and he has given us understanding so that we know the true God. And now we live in fellowship with the true God because we live in fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ. He's the only true God, and he is eternal life. Dear children, keep away from anything that might take God's place in your hearts. Isaiah 40 in 1 Peter says, The grass will one day wither, and the flowers one day are going to fade away. But the word of our God will stand forever. Thanks be to God. So masterfully, the writer here of 1 John chapter 5 uh, rhetorically speaks of what I think is every leader's, every leader's greatest ongoing challenge. It's an ongoing challenge. Um, you never once and for all do it. it it's, it's ongoing. And you have to do it regularly. If you're not doing it at least twice or three times a month, you're not leading well. You constantly have to do this. If not, it's being neglected. And if you're a leader of a particular area, you're a leader of a particular segment, maybe it's a division in a company or corporation, Maybe you run your own business, you've got seven or ten employees, it doesn't matter. Or you're in ministry in a nonprofit and you're leading a particular area, a uh, department or whatever. It's still important, it's still apropos. You have to answer the question that is on the mind subconsciously and consciously of every person that's involved in that business, that enterprise, that nonprofit, or that local church. And here's the question What are we here for? Why am I here? Why do I do what I do? Peter Drucker, the great 
guru of management used to say when he would go and do consultations, he would ask two questions. One, what's our business? And two, how is business? <laughs> what's our business? And number two, how is business? What's, what's the writer here doing? He's saying, listen, this is our business. This is why we're here. So people can know Jesus Christ. I mean, that's it. It all rises and falls on this powerful, beautiful, incredible, life-transforming gospel. In fact, he says it. Now, notice that 1 John, and, and, if you, and if you do the one-year Bible reading as we advocate here at Christ Church to invest in your own spiritual development and leadership, you would know that after you've read John's gospel just uh, several weeks ago, a couple months ago, I guess, as it is now, but nonetheless, as you read John's gospel, John's gospel is foundational for the epistle. Because what does John 1 say? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in the beginning was nothing created that was not made without Him. And in Him was life, and that life was the light of the world. And the true light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot <coughs> overcome it. There's evil in the world. There are challenges in the world. There are attacks that can come your way as a leader. But if you foundationally have believed in Jesus Christ, you have life. And, and isn't that what he says here? Um, isn't that what he says here in verse 12? Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have God's Son does not have life. Now, this is a strong, strong apologetical argument for Christianity. And yes, respectfully, Christianity alone. C.S. Lewis, I think, puts it very well in the book Mere Christianity. I think he does a beautiful job talking about how other religions in the world have some truth revealed in them. I mean, otherwise, why would... Why would millions of people be Buddhist? Why would millions of people, uh, of course, subscribe to Islam and to the, uh, and to the Islam faith or the Muslim <laughs> faith? And so there, there, there are some truths that are revealed in some of the teachings and some of the religions of the world. But it's only in Jesus Christ that the ultimate revelation and the ultimate truth of the living God is revealed because Jesus is God in the flesh. And Jesus is, as he said of himself, the way, the truth, and the life. Now, that's in John 14. Here, in the epistle of John, he just, he just says it very succinctly. If you have Jesus, you have life. But if you don't have Christ, and if you don't believe in Christ, you have death. When I was 17 years old, I never will forget reading this for the first time, and it made me feel kind of weird. It made me feel awkward. It made me feel negative a little bit towards Christianity. And it was a truth I had to ponder. And it's this. The wages of sin is death. And when I first read that, I thought, man, that's pretty harsh. The wages of sin <laughs> is death. But if you follow that and plummet that understanding, it never, ever, it never, ever should be confusing in fact, it's, it echoes right here in 1 John 5, verse 12. If I worship Jesus, if I trust Jesus, if I give my whole self to Jesus, and if I follow Christ and I help other people follow Christ, I have life and I'm living in the life-giving substance of the universe. If I walk away from Christ, if I walk away from Christ who is light, then I'm walking in what? I'm walking in darkness. And if I continue walking through sin and rebellion away from Christ, then I'm walking in death and destruction and chaos and brokenness because that's exactly what sin leads to. When you begin to really plunder this, it makes all the sense in the world. At first, it was a little confusing. At first, I guess it was a hard truth for me to hold on to. It seemed quite negative. But really, it was intended to say, hey, if you have Christ, you have life. If you don't have Christ, you don't. So the number one, the number one requirement or the number one assignment is a better way to say it for all leaders is to continually cast vision 
and answer the question, why are we here? You see, people might sign on for a paycheck for a little while. People might hang in there if there are friendships or relationships that can add value to their life. And you want to have a place like that. Of course, you want to have a positive environment. But people rarely stay very long unless they can sign on to a vision, to a mission, or something that's going to not only add value to their life, but they will feel like what they're doing really matters. And if we can remind people that what they're doing really matters and that they can make a difference, they'll not only hang on. You don't want people just to hang on. You want them to be all in. You want them to be all in. Now, let's, um, let's lift up another important reality here uh, because, um, you know, he asked about who can win against this battle. Uh, it's those who profess faith in Jesus Christ. And so he, he's rhetorically asking that, but he's also saying, you know, have you affirmed this in your own heart, in your own life? In other words, do you believe in the mission? Do you believe in the vision of whatever your company is doing? Do you believe in the mission and vision of whatever your nonprofit's doing or whatever the local church is doing? Um, are you involved in that mission? And then he talks about um, uh, the DNA, what I would call the second great responsibility of the leader is to, um, is to continually... Uh, teach and uh, strengthen the DNA of the organization. In other words, if the DNA is strong, if the DNA is healthy, uh, it will in and of itself call out unhealthy DNA. If the DNA is healthy, it will convict and call <coughs> out unhealthy DNA. He just says if you see someone who's going to sin, someone who's going to mess up their life, who's going to you know, hit the wall, uh, and crash, uh, heaven's sake, pray for that person. Heaven's sake, um, I would add, uh, grab him by the hand and say, hey, uh, I care about you. Is everything okay? Uh, looks like you're heading towards some unhealthy behavior here that could hurt you or hurt those that you care about and those that you love. And I care about you, and I care about the place that we serve or the place that we work or the church that I'm a part of. I don't want to see you crash and burn, and I, don't want, I also don't want to see when you crash and burn there to be a ripple effect and an explosion that's going to leave shrapnel <laughs> in the lives of others. So pray. What, what's he saying there? I think he's saying let's keep the DNA healthy. Let's encourage each other. Let's try to help each other stay healthy. Let's try to promote what is good and what is life-giving in Christ and let's pray for someone if they're going off the path. Healthy DNA will call out and convict the unhealthy DNA. But we have to continually cast vision for what is healthy DNA. Um, and healthy DNA is we don't, go we don't gossip. We don't participate in gossip. Um, of days, as Dave Ramsey says in Entre, Entre Leadership, um, you go up. Uh, you don't go sideways or down. You don't gossip. You don't participate in gossip. Um, you also don't participate in character assassination. If somebody wants to engage in character assassination of the uh, senior management, the CEO, the CFO, the business owner, or whatever, uh, you as an employee, you as a manager need to say, now, if you've got a problem with management, and, you know, sometimes I've had problems with management. So, uh Go see the manager. Go see the owner. Go see the CEO. Uh, don't blast the CEO among the other employees. That's just not healthy. If you're in a nonprofit and the president of the nonprofit, the leader of the nonprofit, you've got issues, go talk to the leader of the nonprofit. Uh, don't engage in character assassination. You do that, you lower your own sense of integrity and character. Um. Because that's one of the Ten Commandments. I mean, it says, do not bear false witness against one another. It also says uh, that we're not to uh, uh, engage in, in, in character assassination against one another. Um, uh, I'm, of course, paraphrasing, but I think that's very important that we honor the character of one another. Uh, so, uh, and if, if you have an issue with a lead pastor or senior management or one of the pastors or one of the directional leaders, go talk to them. 
Um, but he talks about praying and engaging in prayer. And then last, he talks about the unpardonable sin. He doesn't call it that, but it's very, it's very close to that. Um, he, he talks about the sin that can lead to death. Um, the sin that can lead to death. Jesus speaks about this sin. He calls it blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Blaspheming the Holy Spirit is when you harden your heart towards God. And you do it in such a way that the Holy Spirit cannot convict you any longer of your sin and your mistakes. In other words, you're no, long, you're no longer in awe of God. You're no longer impressed with God. You're no longer thankful and humbled by the grace of God, the incredible, radical, life-transforming love and grace of God to redeem you, even you, a sinner. You've lost that for some reason. You have justified your sin. You've justified your anger. You've justified your bitterness long enough where you have become your own God. That, that is the death knell of any follower of Jesus. And that's exactly what he says, isn't it? Dear children, verse 21, keep away from anything that may take God's place in your hearts. That's idolatry. And idol idolatry is simply this. It's not hard to understand. Idolatry is when anything gets first place in your life other than God. Because whatever gets your ultimate trust gets you. And if you ultimately trust anything other than God, then whatever it is that you ultimately trust has become your God. And many of us worship relationships over God. We worship a spouse. And see, that's the trick of the enemy. The deceitful, conniving trick of the enemy is to actually make something good because Loving your spouse should be good, right? Loving your child should be good. Of course it is. But there are some people that worship their child over the living God. You see how crafty the enemy can be? Work is good. In fact, it existed in the Garden of Eden before the fall. Work is good. Some people worship work over God. The enemy is so crafty. And no wonder Jesus didn't mince words when he said, that's, that's not my family. Whoever is my family is who? Whoever follows and obeys the will of God and whoever follows me, that's my family. Whoever, in other words, Jesus is saying, whoever puts God first is my sister or my brother. You don't biologically or bloodline have to have anything to do with me as far as related to me. But if you love God, and you're going to follow God above all else, you're my brother, you're my sister. I mean, Jesus just totally put that in perspective. And really, at the end of the day, is that not what this season of the year is all about? Is that not what Christmas is all about? You know, John and Charles Wesley disagreed with each other quite a bit. In fact, they did it all throughout their lives. Charles wanted to stay married, so John wanted him to get on the horse and go with him and preach all over the place. And Charles said, no, I'm married. I've got to stay home some. John was married too, but it wasn't a good marriage. Charles also disagreed some, especially when it came to some of the Christmas hymns that he wrote. You may not be familiar with this, but Charles Wesley wrote several different publications. One was written somewhere around 1740 or 1741, and we don't have any copies of that. He later wrote another edition um, that we do have copies of that were printed in 1745, and uh, it's actually called um, The Poetical Works of uh, John and Charles Wesley Reprinted from the Originals uh, that were reprinted in a publication we have in 1869. But these were Christmas hymns, Christmas hymns from Charles Wesley. John Wesley asked Charles not to print some of the hymns. 
And then John actually asked him not to print some of the verses. Let me give you an example of one of the hymns that John didn't want him to didn't want him to uh, to leave in. It was a, a beautiful hymn called "O Mercy Divine." I'll just read a few of the verses in the beginning, and I'll read the last few verses that John Wesley asked Charles to leave out. O mercy divine, how couldst thou incline my God to become such an infant as mine? What a wonder of grace the Ancient of Days is found in the likeness of Adam's frail race. He comes from on high who fashioned the sky and meekly vouchsafes in a manger to lie. Our God, our blessed, ever blessed, with oxen doth rest, is nursed by his creature and hangs at the breast. In other words, he he made Mary. He created her. Now he's with his mother finding nourishment. The last few verses, verse 11 through 16, to the end they repair to see the young hare. The end is a palace for Jesus is there. Who now would be great and not rather wait on Jesus their Lord in his humble estate? Like him would I be, my master I see, in a stable, a stable shall satisfy me. With him I reside, the manger shall hide, mine honor, the manger, shall bury my pride. And here will I lie, till raised up on high, with him on the cross, I recover the sky. Those last few verses, John wanted Charles to take out. I'm glad Charles loved his brother enough to disagree with him. That disagreement is not well known because Charles never disagreed with John in public. It was between them. And it was letters that they wrote back and forth each other because Charles still respected John as the leader of the Methodist movement. It's hard to be second chair sometimes. But Charles was a strong second chair. Because, you see, he had his own faith. He had his own convictions. But at the end of the day, he still could challenge his brother when he thought his brother was wrong. Here's the hymn that Charles Wesley wrote for Christmas that John sang in the last few days of his life. He tried to sing. He was weak, and he often couldn't quite get the words out. All glory to God in the sky and peace upon earth be restored. O Jesus, exalted on high, appear our omnipotent Lord, who meanly in Bethlehem born did stoop to redeem a lost race. Once more to thy creatures return and reign in thy kingdom of grace. When thou in our flesh didst appear, all nature acknowledged thy birth, arose the acceptable year, and heaven was opened on earth. Receiving its Lord from above, the world was united to bless the giver of concord and love. The prince and the author of peace come then to thy servants again, who long thy appearing to know thy quiet and peaceful reign. In mercy established below, all sorrow before thee shall fly, and anger and hatred be o'er, and envy and malice shall die and discord afflict us, afflict us no more. No horrid alarm of war shall break our eternal repose. No sound of the trumpet is there where Jesus' spirit o'erflows. Appeased by the charms of thy grace, we all shall in enmity join and kindly each other embrace and love with a passion like thine. In other words, Charles is echoing much of 1 John 5, that if we have Jesus, the Christ child of Bethlehem, we have life. And if we have life, our heart is to embrace, not to divide. Our heart is to forgive, not to hold bitterness and anger. Our heart is to lift up and not to tear down. And if we have life, then we continually want others to know life. Our greatest description as leaders is to continually cast the vision for who we are and what we're about, and then to help lift up the DNA, make it as healthy as you can, because healthy DNA often produces a healthy environment for people to work, to do life, 
and to hang on to the mission, uh, especially if it's a God-honoring mission. Thank you for being a part of the podcast today, and Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.